What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Crack a Pack series. I hope you all are doing very, very well today. I am very excited to be opening up a pack of the 2015 core set, which, uh, okay, I gotta be honest. I, I am excited about it, but there aren't a ton of really good pulls in this one. There are a few, though. Uh, Garrett comes to mind for sure. Uh, it was one of the planeswalkers of this set that was, I think, really, really exciting. Uh, there's a number of other ones, of course, that we'll hopefully see as we go through this set, but uh, do keep in mind, um, we are gonna determine what our first round draft pick will be, but this is a core set. So just as we go through, keep in mind, the power level of the cards may not be uh, quite as high as we would normally see in your average expansion. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, Welkin Turn is a 2-1 for one and a blue. Uh, it does have flying, uh, but it can only block creatures with flying as well. Uh, and actually, I don't find that to be a huge drawback. I will go ahead and say a 2-1 for 2 with flying generally means it's going to be an aggressive early game. Uh, and that's actually really good. I'm all for that. Uh, it does, you know, obviously have a little bit of a drawback. It's not going to be able to trade off with something on the ground. Uh, and so it has a little bit less late game presence, I will say, or I'll say mid to late game. Uh, if you're in a losing position, this card is not amazing. However, uh, it is a really nice early aggressive card. I think it's perfectly fine. Not amazing. Hopefully not our first pick, but I don't hate it. Uh, it's a perfectly reasonable two drop. <clears throat> Uh, Miner's Bane is a 6-3 for 4 and 2 red. Uh, you can pay 2 in a red and it gets plus 1, plus 0, and gains Trample until the end of the turn. Uh, what's really nice about this is that Trample. Uh, obviously, the 3 toughness makes it a little bit tricky, uh, just because it's probably going to like trade off with something much, much lower uh, in terms of power level than it. And that's obviously not ideal. You really want to be you know, maximizing your, your board presence, and this isn't probably going to stick around too long. However... Uh, if you can invest the mana, it is nice to be able to, to guarantee a little bit of damage with that trample. I think that's very, very nice. Uh, or at least encourage them to like double, triple, do some major blocking if they're trying to save themselves that damage. Uh, it's just a really good way to punch through that damage. However, it is a big mana investment. You're getting a 6-3 for 6 off the bat. Not only that, two of that does have to be red. That's not a huge drawback, but that does mean that you're going to have to consider that. Uh, maybe red is your heavier color out of maybe the two or three that you land in. Uh, but then on top of that as well, you have to invest three mana to give it trampled. Now you do get that little power boost out of it as well, uh, but it doesn't boost the toughness. So it's going to be kind of a one shot deal. Uh, honestly, I'd rather have the turn than something like this just because of the mana investment in involved in all this. Uh, but it is a nice way in like a red deck wins to punch through a little bit of that damage late game. <clears throat> Uh, Ephemeral Shields is an instant, uh, for one and a white. It does have Convoke, which was a really cool mechanic. So your creatures can help you cast this spell. Uh, each creature you tap while casting this pays for one generic or one mana of that creature's color. So if you tap a white creature, you can actually pay for the white in this, uh, CMC. And target cre creature, excuse me, gains indestructible until the end of the turn. Unfortunately, not an amazing card. Uh, the save yourself kind of cards I don't love. Uh, this is very equivalent to something that says, you know, prevent all combat damage built, dealt to target creature this turn. Uh, it's a very similar style card. Now, obviously, it does a little bit of a different thing, and obviously, it gets around a little bit more for the indestructible, but I still don't love it. Uh, the, the saving grace of this card is the Convoke, which does mean you don't necessarily have to leave open mana for it, which is nice, uh, but it's not a very good card. I don't think this is something you're going to run most often. Yes, it saves your big powerful creature from a kill spell, but I'd rather just have another big powerful creature for them to have to answer. Uh, and so that's kind of my take on it. Definitely not something I would look to run. Ooh, good card. Frost Lynx is a 2-2 two -two for two and a blue. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls. That creature does not untap during its controller's next untap step. Uh, let's break this down a little bit. So first of all, it is a 2-2 two -two for three. It's a little bit understated. However, uh, that tap down ability is so, so strong, especially in a core set, uh, where a lot of times, like we said, the power level isn't super high, which means their threats tend to be isolated a little bit. Uh, certainly there are going to be, you know, board presences or a, a board state, I should say, where things are very widespread. Obviously, this doesn't do a ton in that regard, but uh, in a situation where your opponent has a couple small creatures that you've been able to manage and then one big bomb, this locks that big bomb down for like two turns, uh, which is great. 
That just means that you have a little bit of extra time to get yourself together, hopefully find an answer for the bomb, a more permanent answer, uh, and then hopefully swing in for the win even uh, on the crackback, which is absolutely possible with this card as well. Uh, tempo is a huge, huge game. Blue does tempo the best, generally speaking. Uh, and so cards like this, I really, really like. Uh, an immediate onboard presence just because it does tap something down and it's it's on a stick. It's a 2-2. Uh, and so it's going to be able to block even if it is just chump blocking if it needs to. So, so far, I actually really, really like this card. I do think this is definitely the pick at this point. <clears throat> Uh, Titanic Growth is an instant for one and a green. Target cre creature gets plus four, plus four until the end of the turn. Uh, it's hard to, to shake the fact that this is just a really powerful pump spell. Uh, it, for two mana, you're getting four, four uh, on the power toughness scale, which is pretty big. Uh, that's a pretty big swing. Uh, it the, the downside to it, it's a two mana spell versus just like a one mana spell. So it's a little bit more obvious if you're leaving up mana for it. Uh, it's a little bit constraining on your mana. Not hugely, of course. Two mana is not a ton, but it depends at what point in the game uh, you, you are that that's actually determined. You know, if you're in turn four and you have the choice of leaving up this or playing a four drop, that's a decision you're going to have to make based on the board state. And generally speaking, I lean towards playing that four drop, which means this card isn't going to be as playable uh, in as many situations as something like a one mana uh, combat trick or something like that. Not to say that's a bad thing. This is a very, very powerful card. I don't want to, you know, get too far away from that. But I do like Frostlings better. I think it's a little bit more of a powerful card. This is just a really solid, though, combat trick if you're in green. Uh, if you find yourself there, definitely, definitely take it if you need something like that. Uh, Child of Night is a 2-1 uh, for one and a black, and it has lifelinks. So any damage dealt by this creature means you also gain that much life. That can be to creature or player, does not matter. Uh, things that get around that, first strike, double strike, anything like that, where uh, the other creature lands its attack before this one does, just means that this doesn't actually deal the damage, meaning you're not going to be able to get that lifelink. Just a, just a heads up if you're a newer player. Uh, this is a very classic card and a very reasonable two drop in a core set. It's not amazing, uh, but that lifelink can come in handy, just buffering your life total a little bit. It can trade off with something at, uh, in the two or three drop slot. It trades off with things like frost links, and that's very, very nice. It's a, it's a good way of keeping uh, some of the early, uh, early threats off the board and buffering your life total at the same time. I don't think it's the pick here. I definitely think frost links is better. However, uh, not a bad card. If you find yourself in black, you need a couple two drops. Child of Night, definitely a very good option for you. Uh, Carrion Crow is a 2-2 for two and a black. It does have flying and it enters the battlefield tapped. So uh, what's interesting about this is uh, it's actually, I think, a very playable card despite the fact that it comes into play tapped. Uh, the reason being, this is a core set. We talked about that at the beginning. The power level is a bit dimmed down uh, and a 2-2 flyer for three is actually very, very good. But when it enters the battlefield tapped, it just kind of evens it out a little bit. Uh, it's still not an amazing card. It's not going to be a huge threat, obviously, but it is something your opponent has to consider that they need some air support if they're going to be able to deal with a card like this. So I actually like it. Uh, still not better than Frostlings, if I'm going to be honest, but uh, I do think it's a more it's it's a better flyer than we saw at the beginning of the pack with the uh, oh, what was it? Uh, the Welkin turn. Uh, I do think I would rather have the Carrion Crow over that. Uh, Naturalize, a very classic card, instant for one and a green, destroy target artifact or enchantment. Uh, a perfectly fine sideboard option. Generally, it's not more than a sideboard option, to, but of course that depends on the set you're in. In this case, it definitely isn't. Uh, it's not like this, this set is flooded with tons of artifacts and enchantments. That's not to say there are not any, which is why I do say this is a good sideboard card. It's something you want to have access to, certainly, but Main deckable, probably not. Uh, it's something you'll pick up maybe lit, mid to late pack uh, if you can hopefully land one, uh, just to have the outs against the artifacts and the enchantments you might find yourself up against. Uh, Invasive Species is a 3-3 for two and a green. When it enters the battlefield, return another permanent you control to its owner's hand. I uh, actually really like this card. Uh, one, let's just start off with this. It is a 3-3 three, three for 3, which means it's on curve uh, in terms of just being a really solid 3-drop. On top of that, though, yes, you have to bounce another permanent you control. No, that is not always a downside. Uh, think in tandem with things like Frost Links. 
Uh, you play your Frost Links on the next turn. You play your Invasive Species, bounce your Frost Links. On the following turn, you get to play the Frost Links again, tap something else down, and now it's all tapped for two more turns. So it's actually a really nice card. Uh, I like this quite a lot. I think I still prefer the Frost Links over it just because it does a little bit more immediately. Uh, this, you have to have something obviously on the battlefield that makes sense to bounce first. Uh, that's not to say it's bad again. I do think it's a really good card, but I lean a little bit more towards that tempo play of Frost Links, I think, uh, over something like this. <clears throat> Uh, Mind Rot is a sorcery for two and a black, and very simply, target player discards two cards. Again, a very classic card, and I do think fairly playable in, uh, in particular with a core set like this. Your plays tend to be a little bit slower, not the most powerful plays in the world, and so by turn three, you will certainly hopefully have played a few cards by then, but uh, you will still have a few cards in your hand, uh, or at least the opponent will, uh, and so it'll be really, really nice to be able to just take two of those away. Yes, of course, they get to pick those two cards, and they can certainly pick two lands, but that's their only two lands. They open themselves up for the potential of getting mana screwed for the rest of the game. Uh, there are certainly other options that they have, but uh, I find Mind Rot to be a perfectly playable card. Uh, not better than Frost Lynx, but certainly not bad. Uh, first uh, uncommon here is Capshow Kite Fins. I uh, hope I'm saying that correctly. It's a 3-3 three, three for 4 and 2 blue with flying. A uh, little expensive already, but uh, when it or another creature enters the battlefield under your control, tap target creature and opponent controls. That is a fairly powerful mechanic. So let's go through this kind of step by step. Six mana for a 3-3 three, three flyer. Like I said, a little expensive. However, it is a flyer, which means hopefully it's going to be able to get in for some damage depending on the board state. Uh, you can count on this to hopefully get a swing or two in, deal a little bit of damage, which is very, very good. Uh, not only that... When this or another creature enters the battlefield under your control, tap target creature and opponent controls, which means this allows you to be more aggressive. Now, what this encourages you to do is play first main phase versus second main phase a little bit more often. And that's not always good. That gives your opponent a little bit more information. A lot of times you like to hold off till that second main phase after your combat step. Just so you swing in, you have all that open mana, you can bluff some stuff. It just makes it a little bit cleaner, gives them a little less information. This encourages you to give them that information early. However, it's at the, the cost on their end of having their creatures tapped down, which just means you're able to get in for more and more damage. If there is a blocker on the field, play a creature, tap that, blo that blocker down. Uh, and then all of a sudden you can swing in with a lot more of your team. And so uh, not only that, if you do happen to find yourself, obviously this is a little bit more of a late game card. If you find yourself in blue, there's probably some draw spells, probably some lower uh, costing creatures that you'll be able to play. So you might get to the point where you're playing two creatures a turn, in which case you're tapping down two creatures on the opponent's side, just making it even better. So uh, as much as I love Frost Links and they do go in the same deck, uh, Kite Fins, I definitely think, has a lot more upside. Definitely a very, very strong pick. Uh, Caustic Tar uh, is an enchantment aura for four and two black. Uh, it is an enchant land, and the enchanted land has tap target player loses three life. So uh, really interesting card here. It gives you that inevitability. Uh, and what I mean by that is it gives you that win condition, basically, uh, no matter what. Uh, it's very hard for the opponent, especially in a draft scenario, to deal with lands. Uh, and so you you target your land, uh, tap it if you need to deal three damage, and that's actually really, really good. You can do that every turn. You do that at the cost, of course, uh, of not being able to use that land for actual mana, which is a bit of a problem. But we're looking at the late game here. It's a six mana spell. We're not looking to do this early. Uh, and so it's not the worst thing in the world. A lot of times what you find is by that point, you have a couple of extra lands. It's not the end of the world if you have to kind of reserve one to the side for a really powerful ability, which this is. However, uh, I find it to be a little bit slow. I don't think it's the most aggressive play. The problem that I have with this is it doesn't help you if you're in a losing situation. Uh, if we look at the Kite Fins, for instance, that can help you in a losing situation. Not only does it, you know, tap down the opponent's creatures, which is actually really helpful for you to be able to aggressively attack, but it also just provides you a blocker. It provides you with a way of dealing with the opponent's board on, on its own, by itself. This does not do that. It does give you the inevitability, but it does not give you a way to deal with the opponent's board. And that can mean it might be a bad top deck uh, if you're in a really bad losing situation. So I don't love a card like this. I tend not to pick them. This is one of those cards, though, that I would definitely try if I found myself in a black uh, kind of focus deck. 
I do think it's worth trying. Uh, and certainly, hopefully, you guys will have a little bit more experience with this set. Maybe you can give me some pointers in the comment section. But I wouldn't take this off the bat based on, you know, the rest of the pack that we have. Uh, I think I'd, I'd much rather have the kite fins. Uh, Devouring Light is one and two white for an instant. Uh, it does have Convoke as well, so like we, we talked about before, your creatures can help you cast this. Uh, and it's very simply exile target attacking or blocking creature. That's a very, very, very powerful removal spell uh, for multiple reasons. One, it is only three mana and instant speed. Two, your opponents, or excuse me, your, your own creatures can help you cast it, which means technically it could be even cheaper. Uh, and three, it exiles the attacking or blocking creature, not just destroys it. Uh, and yes, that doesn't always, you know, that's not the most relevant thing in the world, but there's usually a card, uh, especially in a core set that allows you to bring a card back from your graveyard. It's kind of the gravedigger effect. Uh, and it's nice to be able to say, no, you just can't do that anymore. Uh, what I will say is the, the creature does have to be attacking or blocking. Uh, nine times out of 10, that means it's probably going to be attacking you, which means you're probably in a bit of a losing situation if you're using this, but it is very, very powerful. I honestly don't know if I'd take it over the kite fins. Uh, the kite fins is a very strong creature in my opinion, and I do think it's a backbone for a deck and more of an engine card, whereas Devouring Light's just a very solid removal spell. I think what we'll do, we'll put them both together. Hopefully we'll get a very good rare, but let's see. We got Stain the Mind. It is a sorcery for four and a black. Features Convoke. Name a non-land card. Uh, search target player's graveyard hand and library for any number of cards with the name of the exiled. Uh, name with that name, excuse me, and exile them. Then that player shuffles his or her library. Unfortunately, not a card that I am interested in. Uh, it's it's fine, I guess, as a sideboard card. It takes their big bomb, but uh, I find this very, very bad, unfortunately. Uh, it's a lot of mana. Um, in draft, you never really know what you're going to be getting right off the bat, uh, and so it's really hard to be able to main deck a card like this where you don't necessarily know what they're going to be playing. That's not to say you can't. You can certainly get lucky, uh, but I don't think it's something that I'm interested in here, if I'm honest. Uh, we, of course, got our Mountain and our Dragon token. Uh, so at the end of the day, it is between, in my opinion, the Kite Fins and the Devouring Light. I'm going to go ahead and say I think I would go Kite Fins over the Devouring Light in this case. Uh, if it was a little bit more of a flexible removal spell, like a murder that could just hit something at any time, I'd be a little bit more apt to taking it. But the Kite Fins just seems like such a good backbone for the deck. It's really, really hard to pass up, in my opinion. Not to mention we do have that Frost Links. Hopefully we could wield that. That's a very tall order in a pack like this. But... Uh, it'd be really, really nice to be able to pull that back. So I think I'm going to go Kite Fins. Please, of course, let me know in the comments section if you do disagree. Happy to talk about that. Happy to talk about this set in general if you have any questions. But if you did enjoy this video, please make sure to leave a like or a comment down below. And as always, please make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome content. But with that, I'm going to get out of here. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next Crack-A-Pack episode.